Hi everyone and welcome to QuantPy. In this video we are going to derive formulae for the distribution and quantile of the loss rate of a portfolio under Vasicek's assumptions. This formula forms the basis of the Basel's risk-weighted asset formula and is the Black-Scholes equivalent in the credit portfolio modelling world. Let's set the scene with some terminology. Assume we have lent an amount, which we denote by E, short for exposure, to a friend we call I, for individual. Now, we expect our friend to repay the amount when it is due, but there is always a probability that our friend will miss the repayment. We call this the probability of default. The probability of default will vary over time, depending on the personal circumstances of our friend, and the general economic conditions. It's unfair to blame it all on our friend. If the economic conditions are healthy, it is more likely that the amount will be repaid. We will suppress the dependence on the personal characteristics I and assume this dependence away when we consider a large number of such exposures further on in this video. Now, if our friend does not repay on time, that won't be the end of it. There is a possibility of repayment after the due date, though it is possible that we might not recover the full amount. The proportion of what we would not recover is called LGD, loss given default. Now the conditional amount of loss is the exposure times the conditional probability of default times the LGD. We call it conditional because it depends on the general economic conditions in the lead up to and at the time of repayment. Now let's thicken the plot a little bit more. Assume that we have lent to M people. So the total conditional loss would be the sum of the individual losses, which we can write using the summation notation as follows. Now to simplify matters, let's assume that all of these friends are similar to each other and that we have lent identical amounts to them. This is the aptly named homogeneous portfolio assumption. Using the terminology we have introduced so far, it translates to we have lent an amount E to each one of them, that each one of them have the same deterministic LGD and the same probability of default. Let's see what else we can get from this. Summing M homogeneous terms is the same thing as M times one of the terms. So we can write this as follows. Now, M times the probability of default is nothing but the expected number of defaults. So we can write it in terms of the number of defaults, which we denote by D as follows. Notice, this is not necessarily an integer. So calling it the number of defaults is probably not an accurate terminology, but it does simplify things and frees us up to focus on the manipulation. With our toolkit under our belt, let's dive into our first big topic, which is the conditional loss rate. First, we transform the loss amount into the loss rate by dividing the loss amount by the total exposure. We have lent an amount E to M people, so the total exposure is just E times M. So denoting the loss rate by small l, we get. Next, let's move on to the distribution of this loss rate, i.e. let's try to determine its cumulative distribution function, which is simply the probability that the loss rate is lower than a given value. Substituting for the loss rate, we get. Isolating the number of defaults on the left-hand side, we get. So now everything depends on the statistical characteristics of the number of defaults, and ultimately on the dynamics of the defaults process. In that regard, Vasicek assumes that an individual defaults when the value of the asset falls by a large amount, where large is defined in relation to a threshold. Let's pretend for now that we know this value. The uncertainty or innovation in the asset value of an individual I is assumed to follow this process. 
where both s and epsilon are assumed to be standard normal. The epsilon can be interpreted as the individual specific or idiosyncratic risk factor, and the s, as in systemic or common factor, drives the correlation between the individuals. The epsilon are assumed to be independent of each other and of the factor s. This particular form with the square root and all that looks very complicated, but it enables a very simple interpretation of the uncertainty in the value of an individual asset and the dependence between the assets of different individuals. It is easy to check that the uncertainty in the asset value of an individual is normally distributed because a linear combination of normals is normal. We can easily calculate its mean, variance and covariance. So let's spruce things up a bit. Taking the expected value of both sides, we get. Interchanging expectation and sum, we get. Now, both means are zero, so we get zero. Next, taking the variance of both sides, we get. As both variables are independent, we can interchange the sum and variance to get. We moved the constants out of the operator, and you are expecting this part. Taking the constants out of the variance operator involves squaring it. As both variables have variances equal to 1, we get. On to the covariance. As epsilon are independent of each other and of the systemic factor, we obtain a simpler expression, which is just the variance of the square root of rho times s. As we reflected on just now, Vasicek assumes that an individual defaults when the value of their financial assets experiences large, unfavourable shocks. And large is defined in relation to a threshold. Let's pretend for now that we know the value of this threshold, but it will certainly depend on the financial health of an individual. For an individual in good financial health, it takes large negative shocks to tip them over the less fortunate individuals would tumble, unless their financial assets experience favourable positive shocks. The shocks or innovation in the asset value of an individual is assumed to follow the following process. Substituting the expression for the A, we get. Isolating epsilon on the left-hand side, we get. We know that epsilon is standard normal, so this is nothing but the cumulative normal distribution function. So we can write it as follows. Notice that the probability of default is conditional on the systemic factor. We know that S is a random normal, but we pretend that we know its value. This will help us develop the formulae in order to apply the distribution properties of S later on. But let's leave the conditional symbol as part of our bearings. Now conditional on S. The probability of default of an individual is a known number, as we know all the variables in this formula. So, the default of an individual is nothing but a Bernoulli trial, which I am sure our QuantPy viewers have already associated with the tossing of a coin and defining a random variable that takes a value of 1 for head and 0 for tail. The probability of default is a probability of head, and if head turns up, the random variable takes a value of 1. Otherwise, it takes a value of 0. Now, recall that we have lent to m individuals. So we will have one such random variable for each individual. As they are independent and identical, by the homogeneity assumption, the sum of their random variables, so defined, will give us the number of defaults. Now, we recall from elementary statistics that the sum of independent Bernoulli variables follows a binomial distribution. So the number of defaults conditional on S has a binomial distribution. And we recall that the mean and variance of the binomial variable are as follows. Where we have intentionally suppressed the conditional on S just to make the formula instantly recognisable. If we assume that m is very large, 
Then the central limit theorem says that we can approximate the number of defaults with the normal distribution, which simplifies things a lot. Now we're firmly back on track for the conditional loss distribution. Employing the normal approximation that we just discussed, we get which represents the cumulative normal distribution function. Factoring m and cancelling the square root of m, we get Now m is assumed to be very large. So, if the expression in the bracket is positive, then we will get positive infinity. And by recalling the cumulative normal distribution function, we see that the whole expression will become 1 because n of positive infinity is 1, which we can easily verify in the diagram. On the other hand, if x over LGD happens to be lower than the conditional probability of default, then we will get negative infinity, and the cumulative normal function will then give 0. Next, moving LGD to the right-hand side to make the comparison clearer, we get and yes indeed, you guessed it right, the conditional loss rate is just a step function, returning zero for a loss rate value lower than the conditional expected loss, and returning one for a loss rate value greater than the conditional expected loss. This looks far more complicated than it really is. This is more or less the law of large numbers. Recall, that if we have a large number of trials or individuals here, then the law of large numbers says that the average value of the sample should converge to the expected value, and m times the probability of default is just the expected value. And if we assume that m is large, then the number of defaults in the sample should not be much different from this expected value, which is exactly what we are seeing here. The value of the step function, which represents the cumulative loss rate, jumps from 0 to 1 at the expected value. Now, recall that s is a random normal, so the expected number of defaults will change when we get another realisation of s, and hence the step function will change. To rub our heads around its significance, let's play with an example. Assume that we are interested in calculating the probability that the loss rate is lower than 20%. We extract this critical term. We show this with a red line. We also show that the probability of default times the LGD for one realisation of the systemic factor. The only random quantity here is the probability of default, because it depends on S, and everything else is deterministic. Under the given scenario, the cumulative probability of loss being lower than 20% is 1, or 100%. We draw another random scenario, and the probability of default times the LGD happens to be higher than the 20% mark. So the cumulative probability of the loss being lower than 20% is 0. As we repeat the simulations, we see that the cumulative probability of the loss being lower than the given threshold of 20% is either 0 or 1, depending on whether the probability of default times the LGD is lower than the 20% threshold. As the 20% is arbitrary, these same conclusions hold for any other number. Now let's thicken the plot even further and remove the dependence on S. Essentially, we want to calculate the unconditional loss distribution. We remove the dependence on S by taking the expectation of the conditional loss. We know that the conditional loss takes a value of 1 when the loss is greater than the probability of default times the LGD, and 0 otherwise. So we can write the expected value using the indicator function which takes a value of 1 for values of the variable within the indicated interval, and 0 otherwise. Shifting LGD to the left-hand side, we get... Now, recall that the expected value of the indicator function is the same as the probability of the indicated event. So we get...
substituting the expression for the conditional probability of default that we derived earlier in this video, we get Applying inverse normal to both sides of the inequality, we get Inverse normal preserves the inequality because the normal distribution function is continuous and monotonic. Next, let's simplify it further. Moving the term in the denominator to the left-hand side, we get Rearranging to isolate s on the left-hand side, we get We know that s is standard normal, so we can calculate this probability using normal distribution. Notice, we multiplied the term by minus 1 to reverse the inequality. This is because the cumulative normal gives a probability of less than or equal to, instead of greater than. And this is the Vasicek's loss distribution. And it is not conditional on s. We write this using the same small l without the conditional s. And now that we have the loss distribution, we can go ahead and perform our statistical calculations. So, playtime. We have lined up the quantile and the unconditional probability of default, which will help us give meaning to the threshold. Remember, we have not fully specified the threshold yet. So the quantile. We use the symbol alpha. For example, the 99th percentile, alpha would be 0 0.99. We want to determine the amount of loss x, such that the probability of loss being lower than this amount is alpha. This is what quantile essentially means. Applying inverse normal to both sides, we get Rearranging to isolate the term containing x on the left-hand side, we get Now, applying normal distribution to both sides and rearranging to isolate x, we get This is the famous Basel's formula in its bare form. We will show how Basel formatted it and calibrated it to different portfolios in a future video. Moving on, let's calculate the unconditional probability of default, which means we take its expected value. Recall that the randomness comes from s, so we can write the expected value using the density of s as follows. Small n represents the standard normal density. Substituting the expression for the probability of default, we get. This looks complicated. But the normal distribution, just like the trigonometric functions, comes with a lot of identities, one of which goes as follows. We rearrange the equation to make the application of this identity easier. So we can write it as follows. Cancelling terms, we get. So the unconditional probability of default is equal to the cumulative normal probability of the threshold. Conversely, the threshold can be defined as the inverse normal of the average probability of default. We hope you enjoyed this video and we look forward to seeing you in the next.